All right, uh, we're talking about B.B. Warfield on Scripture sufficiency in this uh, lesson. I've been asked to speak, and I know if you've looked at your schedule, you probably noticed, uh, if you were here earlier, you, you already had a lecture on Calvin's doctrine of scriptural sufficiency. And if you went to Tweeddale's breakout session, he was talking about John Owen on scriptural sufficiency. So what in the world new do I have to offer on B.B. Warfield's doctrine of scriptural sufficiency? Well, I think the main thing we can glean from each of these different individuals, Calvin and Owen and Warfield, by looking at their approaches to these doctrines is if you notice the context in which they wrote and ministered and the specific issues that were uh, coming up at those times. But before we get started quickly, who was B.B. Warfield? Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield was born on November 5th, 1851 near Lexington, Kentucky, and he was raised in a well-to-do family. They had money, so he was able to go to private schools, and while he was young and going to these schools, he really had an interest in the natural sciences, and for a long time, that's what he intended to go into as a career. He wanted to be a scientist. But he went to the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton University, and graduated from there in, in 1871. He had the highest marks. He had perfect grades in physics and in math, so still very brilliant scientific and mathematical mind. When he graduated, his father encouraged him to study overseas, so he went overseas for a time to Edinburgh and to Heidelberg, and while he was there, he felt this call to go into Christian ministry, and so he wrote a letter announcing that was what he was going to do. He was going to go to uh, Christian ministry. So when he returned home in 1873, he enrolled in Princeton Seminary and studied there until he graduated in 1876. While he was there, he studied, studied under the great theologian Charles Hodge and some of the other great biblical scholars and theologians who were there, while he was there, he was licensed to preach, and so for a short time after he graduated, he would be a pastoral supply in various churches. So he was a supply pastor in Dayton, Ohio at the First Presbyterian Church, pastor at, in Baltimore at the First Presbyterian Church. A few months, however, after he, got, after he graduated from Princeton Seminary in August of 1876, he married Annie Kincaid and they went to Leipzig, Germany. And the story goes that while they were there, they got stuck basically in a horrific thunderstorm. And it traumatized Annie so bad that she essentially had what might be diagnosed today as PTSD, but she was an invalid for the rest of her life. And he, one of the reasons Warfield's a hero of mine is not simply his theological mind, but the devotion that he had for his wife because he, he rarely traveled. Other than going to his classes, to church, to chapel, he was there with Annie until she died in 1915. So he, he stayed by her side and took care of her. They never had any children, uh, sadly, but he left us a different kind of legacy with his theological work. When he returned back to the States, he took a job teaching New Testament at Western Seminary in Western Pennsylvania and taught there from about 1878 to 1887. And then when Archibald Alexander Hodge died, and he was the son of Charles Hodge and took over the chair of systematic theology at Princeton, uh, and when he died in 1886, they called Benjamin Warfield to take that seat, and he took that chair. At the time, it was called Chair of Polemical and Did Didactic and Polemical Theology. It's essentially systematic theology. But he taught there for 33 years until his death in February, I believe February, yes, of 1921. So a lengthy career, 33 years at Princeton Seminary plus the nine years at Western Seminary. And just like Charles Hodge, he started in New Testament and finished and spent the bulk of his career in systematic theology. He's not as well known as some of the other theologians that we know of from that era. He's not as well known as Charles Hodge. He's not as well known as his um, colleague across the sea, Herman Bovink in the Netherlands. And I think a large part of the reason for that is unlike Hodge, Charles Hodge, and unlike Bavink, Warfield never wrote a complete systematic theology. He wrote a ton, but he never wrote a single systematic theology. He wrote on topics scattered throughout journals. 
And systematic theologies tend to garner the attention. They stay in print longer. Journals are hard to find. So Warfield's kind of faded into the background, but I think he's one of the, if not the greatest theologian of that era, and he's worth reading. His legacy is rich. In addition to all the students he taught at that seminary, he wrote an amazing amount. He wrote around 40 books and booklets. He wrote around 700 scholarly journal articles and around 1,000 scholarly book reviews. So this was an enormous output. Even his collected works, which is available in 10 volumes now, doesn't cover everything he ever wrote. Volume one on the doctrine of scripture only has about 500 pages and he wrote nearly 1,500 pages just on the doctrine of scripture, 100, around 100 different articles on the doctrine of scripture. So it's worth checking him out because he's been sadly forgotten. He was first and foremost a systematic theologian, but because of the context in which he wrote, he was also very much an apologist. And those two things go together because if you're teaching Christian doctrine, it's going to be attacked uh, from those outside the church and a lot of time from the, those inside the church and apologists are defending the, these teachings. So he was a systematic theologian because he believed that God had given us his word, this revelation, and that we had a duty, therefore, as Christians, to attempt to understand it. And he thought systematic theology was helpful in understanding the scripture. And as an apologist, he believed he had to defend it. He took a slightly uh, nuanced approach to apologists. It wasn't just hitting back whatever happened to be flying. He had a, a, a doctrine of apologist. Uh, he, he believed that apologetics had to establish the foundation. It had to defend the two basic things that are necessary in order to do theology. Now, number one, God. There is no theology if there is no God. And number two, scripture. So it establishes, it shows the evidence for the existence of God and the evidence that this is God's word. Once we have the existence of God and the, the Bible is God's word, then we can build that doctrine on that. Furthermore, he was doing this within a specific context. So the type of apologetics he was doing was very much a reflection of his time. During the late 19th century and early 20th century, the context was very, very different from the context of the 16th and 17th centuries. When Calvin was writing about the sufficiency of scripture, he was dealing with different issues. He's dealing with Roman Catholicism primarily and later some uh, Anabaptist teaching. John Owen's dealing the next century with other issues. But even John Calvin and John Owen, they had far more in common in terms of their broader historical theological context than either of them do with B.B. Warfield. Because the, by the time B.B. Warfield comes along in the middle of the 19th century, you've had the Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution, and things have changed dramatically in the church by this point. You have essentially anti, what Warfield called anti-supernaturalism taking over the church, reducing Christianity to moralism and to ethics. Just a matter of here's the rules, be good and you'll go to heaven, but there was no real doctrinal content. And that was because once you get rid of the supernatural, what's left of this book is it's merely a human writing. And so the Bible began to be criticized like any other human writing. The history of religions school ended up arguing that this is, most of the doctrines in scripture were borrowed and stolen from pagan religions, Greek mythology and things like that. And so we need to do away with all of these accretions to, to Christianity and just get back down to the basics, which is a moralistic view of, of ethics. It's just things we do. But doctrine of the Trinity, the hypostatic union, justification, all those things, we've been fighting about those for too long and they're not necessary because they're not what this, what Christianity is all about, according to them. Warfield was adamantly opposed to that, and he identified the heart of Christianity as being supernatural. He wrote an article called Christianity and Supernaturalism in which he laid out several points illustrating this. He argues that uh, Christianity has a supernatural starting point, God. God is above nature. He created nature, so he's super above nature, supernatural. 
When you read the word supernatural being used 100 years ago, you have to be careful not to read it in the same way we might today where you're thinking ghosts and goblins. He was, he was talking about that which transcends nature and God is the creator, the eternal and infinite creator is the supernatural starting point. Creation was his first supernatural act because he created nature. Nature did not just pop into existence because there's nothing to pop. There's, there's God and, and nothing else, and God speaks the creation into existence. There is a supernatural need that we all have. We have a need for a spiritual salvation, a whole body and soul salvation, and therefore there is a supernatural Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate, whom God sent to uh, die for our sins, and he does a supernatural work his work of atonement, dying for our sins on the cross. And all of this is revealed, Warfield argues, in a supernatural revelation, the scriptures which have been given to us by God. So in order to understand what Warfield will say about the scriptures, we need to put it within that broader context of supernatural revelation. So we'll look at revelation first, narrow it down to one type of revelation, scripture, and then look specifically to conclude at his understanding of the sufficiency of scripture. So for Warfield, revelation broadly considered is the supernatural act of God, but it also has another sense. It's not merely God's act of revealing. We can use the word revelation to speak of the content of what he's revealed as well. So God speaks, he reveals himself, you have, so you have a verbal concept of revelation, and then what he has revealed is revelation. It's the, the nominal, the noun way of looking at that. But within that broader context, there's also two kinds of revelation. He speaks of general revelation and special revelation, and this is a distinction that goes back to the early church that's grounded in passages of Scripture like Psalm 19 and Romans 1, where the heavens declare the glory of God, or, or Romans 1 when Paul says his existence has been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world and the things that he has made. So we can look at the things that God has made and learn something about him. And we can do that with any created work. You can listen to a symphony written by Bach and know something about the person who wrote that. You can look at a painting by Rembrandt and learn something about the artist who painted that. Analogously, we can look out the window at these beautiful trees or look through a telescope at the amazing galaxies look through a microscope at the intricacies of the, what's going on inside the cell or the atomic level and know something about the power and glory of the one who created all of this. And that's what general revelation is, and it's called general revelation because it's generally accessible to anybody who looks around or looks at the mirror and sees themselves. We're creatures as well. We're also the works of his hands. It's, all, it's also called natural revelation because it's looking at nature, at God's creation. The key thing to note here that'll come to be significant uh, at the end of our discussion is that general revelation or natural revelation is insufficient in one way. It's adequate to reveal to all human beings the existence of God and certain of his attributes. So general revelation is adequate to leave all human beings without excuse. No human being who's aware of himself or who can look at the created world around him has any excuse for denying the existence and power and glory of God. But general revelation is also insufficient in the sense that it doesn't deal with our need for redemption. It doesn't reveal the gospel. It doesn't reveal the work of Christ on the cross. So we can look at the world around us and discern that there must be a creator and that he must be powerful and glorious. We can probably discern if there's a creator, he probably has duties for me towards him and towards my neighbor. But where do I go to get that? I can't look at the stars and see that. And if I failed in my duties, which all human beings are aware of, there's also a guilt. What do I do with that guilt? How can I be redeemed from the sin I recognize I have? That's where special revelation comes in. This is when God speaks to man in addition to general revelation and reveals his means of redemption, his works of redemption and what he is doing to save. And he's done this as Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1 tells us, at many times and in many ways he's spoken to the prophets. He's, he's appeared in theophanies. He's spoken in dreams and in visions to the prophets. All of this 
reveals from Genesis onward his promises of redemption. We see him gradually revealing more and more through his calling of, of Abraham and is, you know, the growth of Israel. We learn more and more, and it's all forward-looking. It's all pointing us forward towards this coming of the promised Messiah who will fulfill all of these promises. And that, those messianic promises and all the themes in Scripture, from kingdom of God to exodus to creation and covenants, all of it's pointing forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But none of that's revealed in the constellations. It's not revealed by looking in a microscope. So special revelation is required if we are to be saved, if we are to know about Jesus. It's, it's, uh, it it complements general revelation. It doesn't cancel it out. General revelation is still a means of revelation that does what God intends it to do. But our authority is in special revelation. And the end result of all that special revelation, of course, was the incarnation of Jesus Christ and then the completion of the canonical scriptures. And one point that Warfield makes, going back to the distinction between the sense of revelation as being an act of God and the sense of revelation being the content of what he's revealed, is he he makes the argument that our Bible is not merely a record of redemptive events, the scriptures themselves are a collection of redemptive acts. So not only was he freeing his people from Egypt, that was, everybody recognizes that as a redemptive act, the exodus from Egypt, but what did he do when they got to Sinai? He gave them the law, part of the scriptures. He gave them the Torah, and Moses wrote this down. And so in addition to bringing them out of Egypt, he gave them his law. And then they go into the land. He gives the Psalms, many of the Psalms to David. He, the, he re- inspires the historical books. When we get to the coming of Christ, after he has, uh, I skipped the prophets accidentally, but he inspires the prophets as well. But when we get to Christ, the gospel writers are inspired to write those books. And then Paul and Peter and John, they write their epistles and so forth. So for over a period of a thousand years, in addition to these acts that we all know as acts, like the exodus, the exile, the return from exile, the incarnation, the, the crucifixion and resurrection, the outpouring of the Spirit, he's also from time to time inspiring Scripture, and this is gradually coming together as a canon. So Warfield makes a big, big deal out of understanding that. I suspect a lot of this had to do with discussions he had with his colleague, Gerhardus Voss, because for a time at Princeton Seminary, you had a faculty that included B.B. Warfield, Gerhardus Voss, J. Gresham Machen, Oswald T. Ellis, uh, Robert Dick Wilson, these giants of American Christianity at this time. Uh, and I sometimes think that would have just been amazing to have been on that campus. But when we get to the doctrine of Scripture, specifically the context for Warfield's teaching is a battle for the Bible. Many of you are aware for the so-called the, of the so-called battle for the Bible that went on in the 70s and 80s. Warfield had his own battle for the Bible that was going on. And in the Presbyterian Church, and I know not everybody in here is Presbyterian, but Warfield was, and in the Presbyterian Church at that time, the two sides, what we might call the liberal side and the conservative side, were represented by two schools. The conservative traditional view of Scripture was represented at Princeton Seminary by people like Archibald Alexander Hodge and then by B.B. Warfield when Hodge died and Warfield took his chair. On the other side, you had Union Seminary and Charles Briggs representing these uh, new ideas that were being imported from Germany uh, with the rise of German liberalism and higher criticism and things like that that were being imported into the states. One thing that's interesting is that A.A. Hodge, back in 1880, before he died, he got together with Charles Briggs. The two main representatives of the two sides in this battle got together and established a theological journal called the Presbyterian Review that they co-edited, and they decided right up front, we're going to publish four articles by representatives of this side and four articles by representatives on the other side. The very first article they published was a a now famous article titled Inspiration, co-written by A.A. Hodge and B.B. Warfield. If you've never read that and you're interested in the doctrine of Scripture and defending the doctrine of inspiration, it is one of the best and most clear and concise statements of the biblical doctrine of inspiration. So take the time, uh, 
to, to look at that. The issue kind of stayed academic for about nine years. And then in 1891, this whole mess blew up in the Presbyterian church because Briggs was invited to fill the chair of biblical theology at Union Seminary, and he was asked to give an inaugural address. And when he did so, he took off the gloves. He spoke for almost two full hours in what could best be described as a belligerent, patronizing and condescending attack on the traditional doctrine and those who were defending it. It was so harsh that even his colleagues who agreed with him theologically said he had crossed the line. Well, one thing led to another, long story short, many charges were brought up against him in the Presbyterian Church, and the following year he was removed from ministry in the Presbyterian Church. It didn't end the controversy, it didn't end Briggs' career. Briggs went on and joined the Episcopal Church and ministered there for many years, and the controversy kept going. Briggs, by the way, if you've ever taken Hebrew, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if you're familiar at all with Hebrew, you might have heard of the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew English Lexicon. The Briggs in that BDB is Charles Briggs, the major opponent of Hodge and Warfield. But uh, the controversy didn't end. Even after Briggs was gone and Warfield was gone, this morphed into the fundamentalist modernist controversy of the early 20th century with leaders like J. Gresham Machen and so forth, and it split the Presbyterian Church. But at the time, that was what Warfield was dealing with. From the time he entered Princeton till his death in 1921, the doctrine of Scripture was the doctrine under attack nonstop from uh, various forces in the church under the leadership of Briggs and other. So what was Warfield's doctrine of Scripture? It's a little bit tricky to deal with this given that you've already listened to Calvin on the sufficiency and some of you have heard Owen on the sufficiency because Warfield's doctrine of Scripture is not unique. There's nothing really unique about his doctrine of Scripture. It is simply the doctrine of Scripture found in the Westminster Confession of Faith. If you read the beginning of the Westminster Confession of Faith, what's said out there is what he was, took an oath to teach, at, a vow to teach at, uh, at Princeton Seminary, and so that's what he taught. But we can discern some aspects of Warfield's doctrine of Scripture that can be emphasized and that were emphasized because of his historical context. The first thing, because of his view and his emphasis on the supernatural character of Christianity, he constantly emphasizes that the doctrine of Scripture is really a subcategory of the doctrine of God. It's, if this is God's Word, it doesn't mean much to say something is God's Word if, the, if we have no God. And so we have to consider God before we consider the nature of what God says. And so everything that, that Warfield is talking about concerning the doctrine of Scripture is ultimately related to the doctrine of God and His attributes. If God is sovereign and has all authority, then what is the character of his words, whether, verb, whether audible or in writing? If God has all authority, then his word is all authoritative because it's God's word. If it's God's word, it has God's authority. And if God can't err, if God can't lie or make a mistake, then we know that his word which is an expression of who he is, cannot lie, cannot err. So inspiration and inerrancy were tightly bound together in Warfield's thinking. If it's inspired, if it's God's word, then it's authoritative and it's inerrant. These two, you can't take these apart in his mind. So for him, when Briggs and others were attacking inerrancy, that was an attack on the nature of God. It was, it was an attack on the character of God. Uh, saying that his speech is not authoritative. It's less authoritative than human reason. And he, he was saying that's no different than saying it's less authoritative than the Roman Catholic Church. You're still putting Scripture under a human authority. Rome put it under the magisterium, and you liberals are putting it under a human mind. In either case, you're bringing God down and putting him under a human authority. And Warfield would have nothing of that. He, uh, when he talked about inspiration... The, this word that we get from older translations of 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we talk about the inspiration of scripture. When he, and I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more, but in the context when Warfield discusses it, 
he talks about three basic views of inspiration that are out there, sometimes other subcategories of those views, but he will speak of what he would call a general view of inspiration, which is the kind of view we have when we look at a great work of art or listen to a great piece of music. We say, Bach, that Bach was inspired when he wrote that, or Beethoven was inspired when he wrote Ode to Joy, or Rembrandt, or uh, you know, Leonardo was inspired when he painted the Mona Lisa. We don't mean what we're talking about theologically, but there's a general view of inspiration, and a lot of people today, that's how they, and in Warfield's time, that's what they think when they read the Bible. They think this is an inspired piece of literature in that it's like other literature that's, that's great historically. They'll put it on the same category as the Odyssey or the tragedies of Sophocles or the works of Dickens or Jane Austen or whoever, and it's brought down a notch. Another type of, another view of inspiration that was widespread then and is still widespread now, Warfield termed partial inspiration. And this tends to split scripture up into different parts. So people will say, for example, the spiritual parts of scripture are inspired, but anything in there that speaks of historical facts or issues related to science or something like that, that's not inspired, that's merely human. And we see versions of that around today that, have, that are still around. The last one he'll mention, his own view, is what he would consider the traditional church view, what he calls the verbal plenary view of inspiration. And he uses both of those words for a specific reason. Verbal inspiration means every word of Scripture. Every jot and tittle of Scripture is the Word of God. It comes forth from God. Plenary simply means full or total, so it's in opposition to that partial view. Not only is every word, but every word of every part of Scripture is the very Word of God. It's inspired. And he defines inspiration in this way. He says it is, quote, a supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God, by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. So, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a work of God where he puts his words in the prophet's mouth. And Warfield makes, makes much of that type of biblical language where, where God says in various places like Jeremiah 1.9, behold, I put my words in your mouth. He thinks that's a helpful way to illustrate the nature of inspiration. It's God putting his words in the mouths of human beings without changing who they are or removing their intellect. So I put my words in this person's mouth and he speaks with a southern accent. I put my words in this person's mouth and it's a Boston accent. And that each person in whom he puts his words keeps their intellect, keeps their style. And that's why reading Matthew, you know, Matthew has a different style than John and both of them have a different style than Paul has. So we can recognize the human mouths in which God put his inspired word by their, their stylistic and vocabulary distinctions and so forth. But the result of this is his claim is that in opposition to Briggs, he's arguing that this is the traditional doctrine of the church. Briggs had claimed this was an invention of, of reformed scholastics like Francis Turretin in the 17th century. And, and Warfield saying, no, this view of scripture has gone back to the early church where people from Irenaeus and Athanasius and Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas, all the way up to the reformers, they've all believed that this is the very word of God. They may not have used the same terms we use, but it's obvious by reading them, it's the word of God. And he argued the reason it's the traditional doctrine of the church is because it's what scripture itself says, it's what Jesus taught, and so it's, uh, it's what we have to teach. In looking at the Bible, he, he proves this by just going through Scripture and showing how often the Scripture claims to be, quote, the Word of God. Isaiah 1, hear the Word of the Lord. Isaiah doesn't come out and say, hear the Word of Isaiah. He's saying, hear the Word of the Lord. He's making it clear that this is the very Word of Yahweh, of the, of the Lord. And then in the New Testament, we have passages like 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God, or all scripture is given by inspiration, depending on the translation. That word, the Greek word translated breathed out or given by inspiration is this Greek word theopneustos, and literally it means God breathed, breathing out. 
the tricky part is many of us have grown up with translations that use the word inspiration. We know spiration has to do with breathing. Inspiration is inhaling, expiration, exhaling. So we're in a little bit of a conundrum because of the connotations these words carry in our minds. When we say to, you know, if I go over to Stetson or UCF or UF and if I'm talking to students there and I say scripture is inspired or speak of the inspiration of scripture, most of the time people's mind immediately jumps to that general type of inspiration. It's like any work of art, it's inspired. The other problem with inspiration is it means breathing in. Theopneustos means the breath going out. But we can't say all scripture is expired because that has certain connotations as well that are a little bit problematic. If I say ex scripture is expired, most people's mind jump to one of two things. Death, it's dead, or it's like a bad bottle of milk that's been sitting in the refrigerator too long. It's reached its expiration date. So <clears throat> I prefer those translations that just literally translate it God breathed. It communicates that it's coming forth from God. It's his word, his breath. In these, in these books. The result, however, it's a divine human book. Warfield rejects these views of inspiration that reduce human authors to just mere passive instruments who are completely unconscious. They're like a pen in God's hand. The human being, as he argues, is still involved in this, the human author. That's why the, we have the stylistic differences between individual human authors. But behind it all is the divine author, which explains the unity of all of scripture. This brings us to his doctrine of sufficiency. And again, remember, uh, he's in a different context. He has the same doctrine of sufficiency as Calvin and the early reformers. The, he, he's an heir of reformed scholastic or reformed orthodox theology because that's what his teacher, Charles Hodge, taught him. Hodge taught for around 50 years at Princeton Seminary, and for the bulk of that time, he used a reformed scholastic theologian named Francis Turretin as his main textbook. So even when he wrote his own text, it was modeled after that, and he's teaching that old reformed theology to students like Warfield. So Warfield has the same view of the attributes of Scripture, the same traditional attributes. You can use the acronym CAN, C-A-N-S, to remember these, clarity, authority, necessity, and uh, sufficiency. And we're not going to speak on all of those. I've already hinted at a couple of those uh, already. But sufficiency has to do with a, it was raised in the time of the Reformation, particularly in the context of the debate with Rome, because Rome was arguing Scripture is not sufficient. We have these other oral traditions that have been handed down. We need those as well. Plus, and probably more importantly, it's not sufficient because you need the magisterium to interpret it for you. So scripture is not really sufficient and the reformers and the next generation of reformed theologians were pushing back against that. Warfield is still arguing against the Roman Catholics, but by the time he's writing, he's also dealing with liberal denials of sufficiency. We need human reason a, in the, by the beginning of the 20th century, Pentecostalism and new revelations. That wasn't new to Pentecostalism, by the way, that was, goes all the way back to the early church. You've always had people claiming new revelations, but he's arguing it's sufficient. We don't need any of those. But before we get into the details of sufficiency in our last few minutes, let me first say what sufficiency does not mean, because the doctrine of sufficiency on this point is probably more misunderstood than anything else. And Warfield would speak on this. He'd use different illustrations, I'm sure. But the if I'm driving to work and my car breaks down and I need to know how to fix my engine, this isn't where I go for that. It's not sufficient to learn how to fix an internal combustion engine or a transmission or anything like that. If I want to learn about the human cardiovascular or nervous system or how the brain functions, that it's not sufficient for that. It is sufficient for the purpose for which God gave it. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about sufficiency. It's sufficient for all that we need for redemption and for following God in our Christian life. That's the key point. The older theologians summed it up this way. The scriptures contain all things necessary to salvation. 
So we can't look at general revelation and understand the atonement or, or regeneration or justification. Special revelation does that. That has come through Jesus Christ. And so that is the key point. So once we know what it doesn't mean, we can look more carefully at what it does mean. It has been given to us in order that we might know the means of salvation and that we might take it to the world and share this means of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost around the world. That's the point of it. But it doesn't rule out certain things. We need to make sure we understand that, uh, th that it doesn't rule out divine illumination. So the same Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures illumines us to enable us to understand them. It doesn't rule out Christian pastors and teachers. God has given gifts to the church. He's given certain people these gifts to, to proclaim the word of God. It may sound, I know this sounds silly, but you can illustrate this fairly clearly. None of you go to church and put a Bible in the pulpit and then go sit down and expect it to preach itself. It's not sufficient for that. It's just going to sit there. Human beings must read it and proclaim it and exposit it and teach it. So that, again, is a potential misunderstanding. I, I haven't run across anybody who's said that, but I think that is such a silly illustration, it makes the point clear. Sufficiency needs to be defined. Uh, so it, it doesn't rule out illumination, it doesn't rule out teachers. It's sufficient for what God gave it for. And another point that needs to be made that Warfield made uh, explicit, because this is also part of the Westminster Confessions doctrine, is that it doesn't rule out good and necessary consequences. If you've ever read the Westminster Confession of Faith, you've seen the phrase good and necessary consequence. Everything we need for salvation is either expressly set down in Scripture, it's explicit, or by good and necessary consequence, which means we have to use our minds and the laws of logic, it can be deduced from Scripture. For example, I, if you are a pastor and you have some young man come to you who says, my girlfriend and I want to you know, move in together. We're gonna to get married in a couple of years, but we wanna get used to each other. You don't need to go anywhere else to know that that's wrong. You can point to explicit scripture pointing out the problem with that, fornication and everything else. However, we don't have in the scripture anywhere where the, we, have the, we don't have the Nicene Creed, for example, in the Bible. We don't have a fully formulated doctrine of the Trinity explicitly laid out in the way you will find it in a systematic theology textbook. Does that mean the doctrine of the Trinity is not biblical? No, by no means. But it's a good and necessary consequence of what is expressly set forth in scripture. So you go to scripture and you're reading along and it's very clear that the scripture teaches there's only one God. You keep going and it's clear that scripture teaches that the Father is God. Keep going, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Scripture teaches all of those, but it also teaches the Father's not the Son or the Spirit, the Son's not the Father or the Spirit, and the Spirit's not the Father or the Son. So how do you account for all of that? For it took the church 400 years of wrestling with the text of scripture to put up the boundaries of what we can say that takes into account everything and doesn't rule one or doesn't leave one or more of those other biblical propositions out. If you leave the first one out, you end up with tritheism. If you leave the, hardly anybody ever left the second one out. Nobody really argued about the father being God. But if, if you deny the son being God, then you're in Arianism or some type of subordinationism. Others denied the Holy Spirit was God. If you kept all those and kept the last one out, you could end up arguing for the modalist heresy where God sometimes puts on the Father mask and sometimes puts on the Son mask and sometimes puts on the Holy Spirit mask, which forgets the fifth point that Scripture teaches. The Father is not the Son or the Spirit and so on, which reduce, you know, modalism is most obviously refuted when you read the passages about Jesus praying to the Father. If if the Son is praying to the Father and modalism were true, it would turn the whole New Testament into a farce because Jesus would basically be on his knees in Gethsemane praying to the Father, Father, take this cup, and then running off stage upstairs, putting on the Father mask and saying no, and you know, it just turns all of the New Testament into an absurd joke. So modalism is ruled out by Scripture, but what are the boundaries we need? Arguably, Nicaea set the best boundaries. They've lasted, our Reformed churches, picked those up and carried them with them and has, has continued to teach those. It says, here's what 
we have to say about God that takes into account all that Scripture says and doesn't leave out anything that Scripture says. So when we get, in conclusion, to thinking about the contribution of Warfield to the doctrine of Scripture, he defended the authority and sufficiency of Scripture against a multitude of attacks. I mean, the atheism that was attacking the church in the late 19th and early 20th century was ten times more intellectually formidable than the new atheism that's attacking now. But arguably, there's more atheism today than there was then. It's more widely spread, and today we, we, the, the anti-supernaturalism is arguably worse. Naturalism, scientism, all these views have become more widely spread. So what was once an academic issue is now at the lay level, social media and places like that. You're arguing with your, you know, your former high school friend who used to be a Christian and isn't anymore because he's adopted this new philosophy. So he was dealing with anti-supernaturalism, he was dealing with Roman Catholicism, he was dealing with arguments for new revelations, but when you read him, he gives us a brilliant and wonderful example of how to address those. He read carefully his opponents, and when he argued against them, there were no straw men. He put his opponents' arguments in the strongest form possible and then proceeded to show what was wrong with them point by point by point which is an example many of us could use today because, especially on social media, there is a lot of mischaracterization and misrepresentation of people's views going around. It's not new to social media. There's always been lies and straw man arguments, but it seems, it seems more prevalent in some places and, and sometimes. And as Christians, we're called to something higher. We're called to integrity and honor, which means if we're gonna argue with somebody, we argue with what they actually hold and criticize them for what they actually hold. There's no point in arguing with a straw man, a view that nobody believes. So we can learn that from Warfield. He was an absolute brilliant apologist and brilliant polemicist. He didn't get into personal attacks and people's character. He dealt with the issues and dealt with them brilliantly. So I think he can help us. I would encourage you, if you never have, to read Warfield. You don't have to go out and buy his 10 volume collected works, but just go on Google and, or whatever search engine you use and type in Warfield Hodge Inspiration and read that little article that they wrote on inspiration. It is so fundamental and foundational to what we believe and the arguments in it are still sound today and still useful today. So read Warfield, learn from Warfield, learn how to deal with opponents. The, the opponents always change, but some things remain the same. And so he, we can learn some of the strategies he used, learn some of the arguments he used. But most importantly, I would leave you with this. Like Warfield, stand firm on this, knowing that this is the word of God. Trust in this. He was being hit by tidal wave after tidal wave of liberal type criticisms, but he stood firm on the word of God and never wavered, and he didn't have to. If you stand fast on the word of God, it doesn't matter how much hits you because you're standing on something that's solid, solid ground. He was dealing with uh, attack after attack, people bashing the Bible, hammering at the Bible, hammering at the Bible, but he knew the one most important thing that Jesus had said, and that that he learned and he applied it to this. No matter how much somebody hits the Bible and tries to smash the Bible, as Jesus said, in a different context, scripture cannot be broken. And so that's what I hope we can all take away if we l listen to and read and learn from Warfield, is that scripture is the authoritative word of God. It is sufficient for all that we need for salvation. It's authoritative and it will never be broken. No matter what attacks are coming now, no matter what new attacks come in the future, we can rest assured that God's word will remain firm and that we can uh, live and die in the hope of the promises within it. So thank you.